Good evening, everyone. I'm Georgia Davis, and welcome to AZ Illustrated Nature. As temperatures continue to rise outdoors, many of us, myself included, are looking for some cool relief inside. Tonight, we'll tell you about some educational destinations where you can seek some respite from the summer heat. From jungles to minerals to museums, there are interesting and entertaining options nearby. But first, here's a look at today's top stories. With a four to one vote, the Tucson Unified School District Governing Board last night approved the hiring of H.T. Sanchez as superintendent. Sanchez is the interim superintendent of the Ector County School District in Odessa, Texas. He'll replace John Petticone, who will now leave TUSD earlier than expected. TUSD board member Mark Stegman was the sole vote against Sanchez's appointment, saying TUSD should have brought forward more finalists than just one. Sanchez's contract has not been finalized yet, but the 38-year-old Texas native is expected to start work next month. He'll be the sixth person to lead the state's second largest school district. A building in southern Arizona is among the 11 most endangered historic sites in the country. The Mountain View Black Officers Club on the Fort Huachuca Army Base in Sierra Vista is an example of segregation laws in the United States military for black and white officers. Ed Scheller is president of the Southwest Association of Buffalo Soldiers, an organization that was restoring the officers club between 2004 and 2011. He says that he hopes the designation helps to convince the U.S. Army to save the building. After the hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations and volunteer time, our lease was not renewed and now the face of the building hangs in the balance. Hopefully this is going to change it all. The Mountain View Officers Club at Fort Huachuca is on the State Historic Registry, but it can't be placed on the National Registry of Historic Places until the Army applies because the Army officially owns the building. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. While it may feel like summer is here, the first official day of summer is actually this Friday, June 21st. But of course, here in southern Arizona, we've been experiencing temperatures in the 90s and 100s for weeks now. Many of you are looking for a cool break indoors, and we'll tell you about some options where you can also learn more about the nature and the environment. We begin with Biosphere 2, north of Tucson. It gives you a taste of different habitats under a gigantic glass and metal roof. Tony Paniagua has the story. A lush tropical jungle in the middle of the Arizona desert may seem like part of a science fiction movie, but this green and humid oasis is actually a real life setting for scientific research north of Tucson. The thick forest is housed in Biosphere 2, an expansive multi-million dollar enclosure that covers more than three acres in a former cattle ranch. Experts are working on experiments about ecological issues and challenges affecting planet Earth. You come in here, you go, like, man, this is green. Well, that's the same response you have when you go to Brazil or these other countries in the tropics. You go like, man, it's green. Jos van Haden is one of the scientists who is looking into global climate change and he's focusing on the world's rainforests such as the Amazon in South America. His living laboratory might serve as a backup for a Jurassic Park-like movie scene, but it's being used for studies, measurements and analysis. The way that the plants respond, it's very similar to the Amazon basin. The controlled environment is revealing information about issues such as greenhouse gases, soil conditions and diminishing precipitation. What we are trying to do here at the Biosphere 2 Rainforest is to use this as a model ecosystem for what the Amazon Basin would look like in the 22nd century. So the key things that we need to understand in the Amazon Basin are is how is it going to respond to increased temperature, increased carbon dioxide concentration and drought. Understanding how uh, the Amazon Basin is going to respond in the future really has, has great implications for global warming and climate change because the Amazon Basin holds an enormous amount of carbon that can potentially be released if climate change has disastrous effects on the Amazon Basin forests. 
The habitat changes drastically a few yards away from here, where Caterina Donzuba is dealing with a very different sort of circumstances, although the broader topic of climate change is a common denominator. Donsuba is working on a cooperative effort where scientists are analyzing the plant's ability to survive in nutrient-deprived growing materials, literally rocks. The rocks are ground into a fine powder and researchers are finding out if two species, ponderosa pine and buffalo grass, can survive or thrive. Buffalo grass is a native plant from the prairies of North America, not to be confused with the invasive buffalo grass, which is not from this continent. Buffalo grass has been used uh, in remediation of mine tailings, so it can live in harsh environments. And what we're looking at here is uh, how plants and microorganisms are affecting rock and how soil is being formed in the process. And Onsuba is making impressive discoveries. These little guys can be tough and they are finding a way to grow even in the rock material. Through photosynthesis, they create energy and carbon for their root systems to expand. The amazing thing about this experiment is it shows uh, how much work plants are putting into obtaining water nutrients from the soil. You can see here that the plants are fairly small, uh, both spines and the grasses, because they have a uh, very nutrient-poor environment. But then if you look underneath, you will find that the whole of the soil environment is being explored by the roots. So a lot of carbon goes into the soil to produce these roots so they can take up water and nutrients. In this uh, case, because since they're not water limited, particularly nutrients, so they can supply the plant. And she says the information is vital, especially when learning about carbon sequestration, the process of capturing and storing carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide helps keep our planet habitable, but too much is not a good thing, according to scientists. It's being blamed for global warming. There are practical implications, not direct ones, but indirect ones. So, of course, if plants can explore more of the nutrients from the rock, that would uh, enhance their viability, right? Uh, we can look in the, from the carbon sequestration standpoint, uh, we find out how uh, carbon sequestration is uh, enhanced by the plants. But mostly this is a research that improves our understanding of the world around us. And Van Haren says the understanding and knowledge can be turned into powerful and beneficial tools if used properly. In his case, it's about protecting the remaining stands of tropical forests. Because we can't lose the Amazon basin. It needs to remain a tropical forest. If we would lose it, it would be a catastrophic event. So that's one of the long-term goals. The other long-term goals of Biosphere 2 is really to inform the public. Right? This is what we do as scientists. This is what we go around and investigate. We hope to, over time, also integrate people into taking samples with us and, and, and be part of the research. Long-term goal is increase science literacy. And, and Mark is telling me right now that I have to hurry up. This is the thing when you get a scientist to talk to you. He doesn't stop. <laughs> Tucson is known for its world-famous gem, mineral, and fossil showcase each winter, which is held for two weeks in January or February. But if you'd like to learn much more about magnificent minerals and other substances from our planet, you don't have to wait for the annual event. Next, we take you to a one-of-a-kind museum on the University of Arizona campus. Go right! <sighs> Millions of people are familiar with the mall at the University of Arizona, but just a few steps away from here, there's a whole other world you can explore. It's part of an underground oasis, apart from the hustle and bustle above. Well, this is the University of Arizona Mineral Museum. It's been on campus since the late 1880s. You're looking at over 3,000 different specimens on display in here. Some call it a hidden gem or a treasure trove, and they're not speaking figuratively. And you're seeing pieces that have been donated to the museum or loaned to us in every case. The university has never bought one of these minerals. They are all donations to us, or like I say, have been loaned to us for a certain duration. Mark Candy is the collections manager at the UA Mineral Museum, which is housed in the basement of the Flandreau Science Center and Planetarium. What you're seeing are paintings that were commissioned back in the 1920s by one of the, the uh, managers of Phelps Dodge that we had donated to us back in the 1950s. Wolfenite minerals, you'll see the variations of color and play. A gold case that you can't imagine, these all came from California. Every piece of gold that you're seeing in this one particular case, along with platinum nuggets from Russia. 
Even though many people in our state have not visited this specific destination, Candy says the museum is a historic institution on campus and a precious resource for the country. What you're seeing here is a loaned display right now. This is from the Mark LaFont collection. Uh, Mark is one of the people that has really come through for us and has decided to leave his inheritance to the University of Arizona. These are examples from Hubert de Montmagny's collection. He was a man who left his whole collection to the University of Arizona. In 2007, it was appraised at $7.5 million. It was a wonderful collection. He was one of these quiet little collectors that nobody really knew about until the collection came here on display. The collection includes over 20,000 specimens. You're only seeing about 3,000 different specimens on display. Uh, we have a micromount collection that adds another 20,000 minerals to that amount. Those that have discovered the collection are becoming big fans, and Shauna Whitmore can attest to this attraction. She likes to take her two young boys on exploratory missions throughout Tucson, and this is becoming one of her favorite stops on her expanding route. Can you see that? Watch what happens when I get a light on it. I came about a month ago and fell in love, absolutely in love. It was amazing. Even though it's officially a museum, the facility is about more than delicate exhibitions behind glass enclosures. Mm -hmm. For example, children are encouraged to engage and interact with some of the displays, contributing to their sense of wonder and teaching them valuable lessons along the way. Can you see how much it changes? My boys are all about putting things in their mouth and she's like, come taste the salt rock. and. Like, I know that makes a lasting impression, and for me, too. Uh, um, blue. Blue? You like that blue one the best? I had no idea there was so many different kinds of rocks, and to see a diamond in the rough, like, literally, that it, you would never know that it was a diamond because it just looks like a black stone. So it was, it was really fun. The permanent museum is in the basement, but there's also a smaller exhibit upstairs, which is based on the theme of this year's Gem and Mineral Show. Here, you can learn about fluorites and other treasures from Asia. This is our annual mineral exhibit uh, here at the Flandreau Science Center and UA Mineral Museum. And the theme this year is Minerals of China. And the name of the exhibit is Crystalline Treasures, the Mineral Heritage of China. It's a huge country, the fourth largest in the world, and its mineral resources reflect the abundant variety of sizes and colors. Mark Candy has examples. China is one of the best places in the world to find stibnite. It's, it's amazing what's there. It's antimony and sulfur. It's an antimony sulfide. It's mined for that reason. In fact, these pieces were mined for years and not collected. They were just crushed into ore and utilized for the antimony. It really is amazing when you th consider that these come out of the ground like this. This is what they look like when they're found. This is copper ore. The velvety sheen that you're seeing on it, they call it velvet mal malachite for very good reason. It's not soft, it's not something that's fragile. You could rub the surface of it and would, it would scrape it and bruise it a little bit. The, the theme of the, the Tucson Gem and Mineral Society's main show is fluorite this year. And each year they have a different theme. Sometimes it's the country that the minerals come from. This year they're spe specifying fluorites themselves. Fluorites come from every part of the world. You can find great fluorites here in Arizona. These particular ones are Chinese and Chinese are some of the most exemplary in the world. They really are the best. What the Chinese have realized is that there's a big market out there for minerals and that they have an abundance of mineral wealth. There's a lot of different localities that produce incredible specimens. Can you find your favorite colors? I, I see green over here. Fortunately, if you ever want to learn a bit more about geology, geography, or one of many other topics related to this field, you don't have to travel to China or wait for the annual gatherings in Tucson. The museum is open throughout the year, providing a brilliant resource for education and entertainment under the mall at the U of A. Tony Paniagua, AZ Illustrated. The Afghan government today backed away from peace talks with the Taliban and security discussions with the U.S. We take a closer look at the reversal by Afghan President Karzai and its impact on the drive towards stability in his country. Then before Berlin's historic Brandenburg Gate, President Obama called for a dramatic decrease in nuclear weapons. Margaret Warner explores the prospects for the potential arms agreement with Russia. Miles O'Brien has the story of the strange-looking insects that emerge every 17 years and the scientists charmed by the chorus of the cicadas. 
We continue our series, Inside Immigration Reform. Tonight, Virginia Democrat Tim Kaine. The thing that I think is most important is that as we look at certain things like border security, and I'm open to amendments, we shouldn't use those to delay the path to citizenship. And we close with a call for a renewed focus on the humanities in the classroom from Duke University President Richard Broadhead and actor and author John Lithgow. Studying the humanities and the arts uh, at the college level just put me into the habit of learning that's really defined my life in all sorts of ways. That's all ahead on tonight's News Hour. After food writer William Sitwell bought some old cookbooks at an auction, he decided to investigate even further back in culinary history. If anyone ever asks you, when was the Roman Empire at its strongest? Well, actually, the answer, I think, is when its sources were at its thickest. I'm Renee Montaigne, a history of food and 100 recipes on the next morning edition from NPR News. As you saw in our previous story, some parents are hoping to provide learning opportunities for their children, and there's a place in Tucson that focuses specifically on this young demographic. For this, we're joined by Michael Luria. He is the executive director of the Children's Museum in Tucson, and thank you for coming in and joining us on this blistering hot day. Mm, my pleasure. <laughs> so, summer activities at the Children's Museum. Tell me a little bit about what's going on. Well, the Children's Museum focuses on hands-on, interactive uh, exhibits for children and their families to come and enjoy and of course as you mentioned it is so hot out right now and so this is a great opportunity to get out of the heat come enjoy some uh, you know good air conditioning but more importantly have a fun and educational experience with quality family time and I assume in the summer you see an upswing, right, of attendance with school out, temperatures climbing, all of that. Absolutely. It is our busiest time of year. Pretty much any time kids are out of school, whether that happens to be winter break, rodeo, spring break, and of course summer. So these are the busiest couple months of our entire year. All right. So tell me about some of what you've got going on there at the museum. What would I see if I walked in the front door? Well, you'll see, again, those hands-on exhibits, and they're kind of themed. So we have a public safety exhibit where you have a police motorcycle that you can get on and the lights and sirens work. There's the cab of a Tucson Fire Department uh, fire truck that you can get in and an ambulance. Uh, we also have an electricity exhibit that focuses on different aspects of electricity. We have a build it exhibit where you can work on different things, building blocks. A Bodyology, it's a health and wellness exhibit. It's got a gross store as well as um, a, an orchard where you can pick fruit, a pet vet where you can learn about being a veterinarian and play with animals, uh, stuffed ones that is of course, and then Investigation Station which is our exhibit focused on STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. That's about a year old and one of our most popular exhibits. We also have a space called We World for our kids under five. So it is a smaller space where everything is a little softer. The padding on the carpet is softer. So it's a great play space for our very young ones. Oh, so that's a variety of different activities for kids. And of course, all of them have this, this learning component attached to them. Absolutely. So there is um, you know, learning principles and, and gross and fine motor skills and things that you can do uh, using the exhibits. And we also have school tours. So, and we do still do them in the summer. We call them adventure learning tours. So we have about 7,500 students a year that come through and get an adventure learning tour. And each of the tours are themed and they're all aligned with Arizona academic standards. And then beyond that, we have other programming such as early childhood education programming. We have a program called We, uh, we Play, which is a school readiness program. It's very tactile. It's about dance and movement and music and uh, literature for kids under five. And it's with their parent or caregiver. We also have the one called We Move, which is all about physical fitness for kids under five. And right now, one of our highlights this summer is something called Science Sundays, where we recognize that most kids are out of school and we want them to still have those sort of hands-on learning opportunities. So each Sunday, we offer reduced admission. It's only $2 per person for adult or child, and we do hands-on STEM-based activities. So we do some ourselves at the museum and we have our own science card. But each week, we bring in a different partner who will offer STEM-based activities. And those partners include the uh, Desert Museum, Girl Scouts, Arizona Public Media is one of our partners, uh, the Botanical Gardens Mini Time Machine, machine is an example. Of course, so STEM, science, technology, engineering, engineering. mathematics, yes. right? So, but there were some arts in there, and of course, professional development, career development, too. There is. So with the, the, the buzzword, if you will, in a lot of museums and institutions and educational environments is STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. But there's also a movement to add A for arts, so then becomes STEAM. 
And we have that as well. We have our own art studio at the Children's Museum. And we do hands-on activities every day that are art-centric. Uh, and then that also leads into a very exciting development this fall. We're going to have a brand new art studio and a brand new early childhood education space that's going to be opening late September. Oh, nice. So tell me about that. I mean, how big is this renovation? What will be there? What's oh, the it's, focus age group? It's going to be fantastic. So it's about 2,200 square feet. And about a thousand of it is for the new art studio. We're going to have a, a rubbing station. We're going to have a slate table that you can paint with water, uh, arts and crafts area, easels where you can do chalk. We actually have a chalk totem pole, which should be a lot of fun. So very, uh, and almost like the mini maker movement, using your hands, being very tactile, hands-on. So we're going to have that going on in the art studio. And then we're super excited about the new early childhood education space. It's about 1,200 square feet. It's just for children and their families that are under five, you know, children under five and their families. Uh, again, it's for those really young visitors and it's going to be absolutely fabulous. We have some areas where the kids can role play and they can climb and uh, explore and again very tactile for them. Uh, it's going to be about two and a half times the size of our existing Wii World space. So uh, that renovation starts in mid-August uh, and will finish up in mid to late September. So when you say children's museum, you really mean children. I mean, I, I haven't seen many exhibits that are actually geared for toddlers. No, you're right, and, and traditionally that has not been the case, but these days in children's museums like ours here in Tucson as well as others around the country are really focusing on early childhood education, giving kids and families the skills and tools necessary to succeed once they get into kindergarten. And part of that is to promote things like literacy. So we do a lot of reading in our ECE programming and in our ECE space we provide opportunities for children and family to read together uh, as well as art and music and movement and things like that. So there is a really renewed interest and focus on early childhood education. So really me as a, you know, a single adult, it, it wouldn't be a kind of experience that I would want to have. I really would have to have a kid with me to yes, get the, the most Yes, so uh, <laughs> the Children's Museum is really geared towards kids from 2 to 10. Uh, some of our exhibits, like Investigation Station, some of the learning principles and, and some of it skew a little bit higher. And of course, things like Wee World uh, skew younger. But uh, yes, it is not a place for, for unaccompanied adults to come in and enjoy the museum. Although we're happy to give tours, and we do a fall fundraiser every year where, where adults get to come in without the kids and play. Oh, I'm going to have to keep an eye on that. So we only got a few seconds left, but you know, admission prices? So uh, second Saturday of every month is $2. Right now for Science Sundays through Labor Day is $2 per person. And our normal admission is $8 for adults, $6 for kids and seniors, and under one is free. All right, sounds good. Well, thank you so much again for coming in and doing us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Come and play at the Children's Museum. <laughs> sounds good. And now we return to the Flandreau Science Center and Planetarium where director Bill Plant tells us about some additional activities you can enjoy under comfortable temperatures. Flandreau Science Center and Planetarium is one of the most recognizable landmarks on the University of Arizona campus. It is named after Grace Flandreau, an author from Minnesota who was born in 1886 and died in 1971. She left hundreds of thousands of dollars to the University of Arizona and along with additional funds, this facility was built in the 1970s. Today, it offers a variety of programs for people from all types of backgrounds and ages. Anyone who thinks science is awesome uh, is gonna have a good time here. And I think you know the initial vision of this place as a place to promote public understanding and appreciation of science still holds true. That is Hector Vector Star Projector, and anyone who's uh, grown up in Tucson or lived in Tucson for very long has probably heard that name, and that's our star projector, and it's capable of producing 8, 000, over 8,000 stars projected on the planetarium dome, and it's able to recreate the majesty of the night sky, and it's been doing so since 1975, and it's still in operation today. Another thing that we offer here in the planetarium is music laser light shows, which are a lot of fun. So we have a variety of different kinds of music that are basically displayed with laser, light laser lights on the uh, planetarium dome. And so we have uh, Pink Floyd, we have uh, you know, things like Justin Bieber, and, and we're trying to get some more current kinds of things like a dubstep show. Um, but we also have some really interesting uh, kind of stories that we can project onto the, the dome with the laser light shows as well. 
So the Marine Discovery Program is sponsored by the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And the director, Katrina Mangan, has been collaborating with us to move that program from a different kind of inconvenient spot on campus to Flandreau. So we've been working with her to develop a marine discovery classroom, which is a really cool new space. And uh, we started having classes in there in 2009. And all, the cool thing about that program is that it's all the instruction is done by U of A undergrads. So when the school groups come, they get to learn about the importance of our oceans and do shark dissections and squid dissections. And all of the instruction is being done by these U of A college students. So they get to see you know, kind of what's happening at the U of A and what, what college life is like and what it's like to be a student. And it's inspiring and a lot of fun. Today, as you explore the Great Balls of Fire exhibit, you'll learn about all of the mysteries that we investigate through our studies of asteroids, comets, and meteorites. You'll also so Great Balls of Fire is a traveling exhibit, exhibit that we're hosting here, and it's here through uh, the end of March. And as part of that exhibit, we're also adding some new exhibits that are about the OSIRIS-REx asteroid sample return mission, which is being led by scientists here at the U of A. So we've got some really fun hands-on displays that talk about comets, asteroids, and meteors. And you can also learn about some of the cutting edge science that's happening here at the U of A. Our, our public observatory is open Wednesday through Saturday. And as long as the sky's clear, you can go up and interact with our really great uh, volunteers who run the telescopes up there. And they can show you uh, the Andromeda galaxy or the rings of Saturn. And, you know, we live in such an amazing time when there's so much amazing information available from all of the NASA missions, and there's these beautiful images of planets and stars and galaxies that you can find at any time. But there's something so special about, you know, looking through an eyepiece and, and seeing a place that's, you know, 700 million miles away. You know, it's just such, a, it's such an amazing experience. We have a new exhibit that just opened this summer called Exploring Sky Islands. And it's all about the amazing region that we live in here in southern Arizona with the amazing biodiversity that, that the mountains and the uh, unique environment allow. And it's a hands-on exhibit where you can create an avalanche, you can understand how soil infiltrates down into the aquifer, um, you can build giant hoodoo rock formations, and you can learn about some of the science that's being done here about how mountains are formed. It's a lot of fun. I keep saying, you know, I have the coolest job on campus, you know, because not only do I get to, to work with such amazing people, but I get to see, you know, the smiles on all of these kids and families' faces when, you know, they discover something new for the first time. And that's, you know, what's the most satisfying for me. That's our show for tonight. To post a comment on any of these stories or to keep up with the latest news, go online to our website, azpm.org. I'm Georgia Davis. Thanks for watching.